John chapter 9, verses 24 through 41. Then again called they the man that was blind, and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether you be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, and as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, and he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and said unto him, Are we made blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth.
love this song that we're going to be singing. So many times when we think about the cross of Christ and what he's done for us, his love for us, his forgiveness, and knowing all of our sin and yet still dying for us. When we think about that and the, the glory of all that and God's character and his goodness, it just, it's indescribable. There's no words that are really adequate to explain the gratitude that we should show to him. And I think this song kind of amplifies that and shows that to the best of our ability, we just want to put out there how great our God is and how grateful we are to him for what he has done. Amen.
Good to see you this morning. John chapter 9 is where we're at. Jesus' miraculous healing of a blind man is recorded only here in John chapter 9. In fact, this is very particular because it is someone who was born blind. It wasn't someone who had an accident and saw for a couple of years or a couple of days, a couple of minutes, but this person came into the world blind, called congenital blindness. And it's exactly what is going on here in John chapter 9. And we saw last week the miracle in verses 1 through 23. But today I want you to notice the difference that Jesus makes in a life that receives spiritual sight. And as we uh, followed along in the reading, as uh, Brother Jim read the scripture this morning, I want you to see one thing I know, I was blind, now I see. You see that in verse 25. One thing I know, I was blind, now I see. And there are two specifics that we're going to look at this morning as we finish up uh, the chapter of chapter 9 in John. There's number one, rebuke of the blind man from the Pharisees, and also, secondly, reckoning of what Jesus is doing with the blind man and the Pharisees, okay? So number one, rebuke the Pharisees and the blind man. Rebuke. All right. For the second time, the former blind man is summoned to appear before these godless leaders. He is asked again to come before him. He has already given them all of the information they need, and he's backed up exactly what Jesus Christ has done in his life, and they're still questioning. They're still questioning him. So first of all, you see, Jesus is denounced by the Pharisees. He's denounced by the Pharisees. If you look in your Bible, verse 24, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Give God the praise. We know that this man that you're talking about is a sinner. Well, the Pharisees persisted in assuming that the healed man is lying. They have uh, stood their ground. They said, there's no way. He's got to be lying because actually there's been no one ever recorded and ever known that's come into the world blind and they've been healed of their blindness. Zero. And so he's got to be lying. He's got to be. And so they order him to what? They order him to, it's interesting, give God the praise. You say, well, why is that? Give God the praise. This is what he's been doing all along, but they want him specifically to give God the praise. Well, this phrase used in the cross-examination is used in trials in the Sanhedrin. And so in context, you would know something about the history here. You say, okay, why would they use that verbiage? It's a Hebrew idiom, which means speak the truth in God's presence exactly what it means. And an example is found, you remember, in Joshua chapter 7, verse 19. You remember Achan? My Achan back, people will say, Achan, what did he do? He did something he shouldn't have done. He took of the, uh, the garments, he took of the things, and he should not have done that. He was told not to do it. And what did they do? Joshua said unto Achan, Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. It's the same kind of thing here. The exact same thing that they're doing and they're asking him to do. This phrase could also mean, give God the praise for the miracle, not Jesus. Now you know the rest of the story. Oh yeah, okay, I can see this. This is what they're going after. Because why? It didn't make a difference what they did. They believed Jesus was a sinner. And they wanted to believe that, and they wanted to nail him and prove that he was. And so here they are. They are antagonizing. They're denouncing Jesus, and they're antagonizing the blind man. This is what the Pharisees told him to do. And for the Pharisees to assume that Jesus was a sinner was a false assumption. We know because we've got the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse tw uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 says, Speaking of Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He's never sinned. He's sinless. And he has to be sinless if he's Jesus Christ. Because he's God in the flesh. And so... He has to be sinless. He is sinless. And there's no question about that. But they wanted to, qu to question him. Verse 26 and 28 says, Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? 
Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. See, to rail or revile is the answer of those who have been defeated in a debate. You'll see this often. They cannot support their position, so they resort to abuse, and they revile. They reviled not only the man, but they also reviled the master. See, they reviled him that he was lying, and he wasn't doing what he said he was doing. He's trumped us all up, and he's not been blind since birth. Not only they revile him, but they turn and they revile the person that they're after, and that is the master. You see, here in verse 29, it says, We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. It's interesting. They call the Lord this. And we say, well, you know, it says this fellow. Actually, if you read, as for fellow, it's in the italicized because it's not in the original. You know what it originally says? This is what it says. It says, we know that God spake unto Moses, this we know not from whence he is. Do you see that now? You see the condemnation? Do you see they want to belittle Jesus? And they said, this, this is not. They're calling their Messiah by a derogatory term. And so they are making little of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not fight back with contempt, you remember? If we read later on in First uh, Peter chapter two verse twenty three, the next verse says, "Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously." Sometimes we are we're reviled, we're said uh, uh, a bad about, and we want to what? We want to get revenge. We want to get back. We want to draw our sword and say, ha, how dare you do that to me? That's unlike God. That's unlike Christ. Because what did Christ do? He didn't do anything. He what? He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. This is what he said. I'll leave that up to dad. You want to throw that at me, I'll leave that up to dad. You ask dad whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Because I am telling you the truth. And we don't have to defend that at all. You don't have to say anything. In fact, if we would be quiet, if we would be quiet, it makes a very big impact. Remember Jesus going to his crucifixion? Pilate said, you're not going to say anything? Don't you know what they're doing? Aren't you going to say anything? And he uttered not a word. Nothing. Why? Because he was doing exactly what dad said to do. And he was coming and giving his life a ransom for everyone. And so he was quiet about it. There was no arguing. There was no talking about it. He didn't need to say anything. And so here they are. They're throwing at him everything they can. And they're denouncing uh, that he is who he says he is. They continue to speak and they say, we don't know where he is from. That's double talk. Because why? We already learned this in John chapter 7, verse 27. What did they say? John 7, 27 says, how be it we know this man whence he is? We know who he is. But in 9, 29, we don't know where he's from. So be careful and listen to what people are saying. Because what? They'll contradict themselves. And this happens over and over again. The Jews claim to be the disciples of Moses. I mean, you have to understand, Moses never healed a blind man. Never. And one greater than Moses was in their presence, and in their estimation, Moses stood next to God. Because why? God had spoken to Moses the law. And they looked with disdain at the man before them. Their lips were curled with scorn. And that was a confession of their own blindness. They were far more blind spiritually than the man standing before them had ever been blind physically. They couldn't see this. So what happens? Jesus is defended by the blind man. He's defended by the blind man. Verse 25 says, he answered and said, 
whether he be a sinner or no, I know not one thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. The Pharisees tried to get the beggar to change his story. And he gives glory all to the Lord for what happened in his life, even though the unbelieving Pharisees interrogate him. And God can take opposition and turn it around for his glory. We know that from Scripture, Psalm 76, verse 10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. You see, the healed man responds again with a simple truth. I was blind, now I see. His testimony. It's hard to refute a testimony like that. I don't know what you can say about him, but I do know this. I could not see ever, now I can see. So I put that into your hands. Who alone can do that? I mean, who alone can do that? That has to be a man of God. Because no one does that. And so there's this argument that they're trying to get in with him, and he's making it very clear, this is who he is. It's hard to refute that. And we don't have to know all the answers when telling people about the Lord. I want to point this out right here. You say, I've never been to school. I've never... Blah, blah. Are you born again? Yes or no? If you are, you can tell them exactly what happened to your life. You say, does that make a difference? All the time. All the time. Because why? There's people all over the world just like you. Same type of life. Same type of questions. Same type of wondering. What's going on? What, what, what is this? I can tell you this. The Lord Jesus Christ, I asked him to forgive me of my sins, to come into my life and to save me. He did that. My life's been different ever since. Ever since. And so people need to hear that. Because what? That's hope. That's hope for people who are seriously in need of some what? Some good cheering up. We live in a culture, in a world today, that it's like you really have to look around to find something positive to see that's going on. And so this is a very positive thing. That Jesus Christ is the hope that everyone is looking for. So many people think, well, if we get a new president, if we get a new government, if we get a new this, if we get a new that, you're already looking in the wrong places. There's only one answer, and he's been the same answer forever. His name is Jesus. He's the answer. And so, well, if we did this, if we changed this, then every... Does it make a difference? Trust the Lord, obey Him, give your life fully to Him, and allow Him to do exactly what He wants to do. Exactly. You say, that sounds too easy. That's the problem. We're a very prideful people. We don't like easy. Because why? Because if it's easy, watch this, anybody can do it. I mean, I, I want to be special. I'm the only one that can do that. That's, that's stinking thinking. So don't go there. Don't do that. Because why? Because you want to maximize the glory you give to God. And the way we maximize the glory to give to God is what we do. We bow the knee to Him and do exactly what He wants us to do, when He wants to do it, how He wants it done. And that's giving our life and what? Being able to see. That's taking the blinders off and actually being able to see for the very first time. And watching exactly what he's doing. And rejoicing. Because why? He's doing it. I don't have to do it. He's doing it all. I'm just in on what he's doing. And I want to be a part of what he wants to do. That's the great relationship he wants with all of us. 
Verse 27 says, he answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? I mean, the blind man, you literally got to think of this. He's losing patience. I mean, I've not seen anything for life, and now I see everything. I mean, I see everything now for the very first time. I know when we read, we just like, we forget what's going on. He's never seen a thing. This is his first hour of seeing. And they're sitting there questioning. Didn't it remind you of the guy that's sitting by the pool of Bethesda? How dare you get up and walk? Are you out of your mind? I've been here for decades. And I can't walk? Are you, are you crazy? I mean, you just see, this is the response. I mean, I, you got to be kidding me. He doesn't care that what? That they have their big robes. They have their phylacteries on. They, they have it all on. And they're the ones that everybody hushes when they go by. He's never seen that. He's like... All I know is you guys look pretty dressed up, but don't have a clue what's going on. And you're saying that it's, it's a problem and he healed me this day? You remember in context, we talked about this last week, it's on the Sabbath day. You can't get any holier than giving somebody the first time a sight to see. And it's just such a picture of who we are without Christ. We're totally blind. Can't see. Stumbling all over the place. And then you're going to give sight, and then you're going to question who he is and what he's doing because he's not doing it like you want. I mean, think about this. The word also marks an advance in this man's understanding of Jesus. It, it's, you have to read this and you think, this is kind of comical. He's like, he's like, if I had enough patience, he answered them, I told you already and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? I mean, you can just hear, will you, are you kidding me? We're from Moses. We're not from this. And they didn't even say fellow. This. Today we'd say, this is trash. Nobody gives this. And I mean, can you, can you see yourself? Well, man, you call it trash all you want. You call it this or that. But I tell you what, I can see, and I've been around and listened to your voice for a long time, and I've never seen one thing. But you know what I'll never forget? I'll never forget his voice. Because when you can't see... Your hearing is really good. Because why? Because you've depended upon that. And so you really know somebody's voice. I can just see him now. Just, man, I've heard your voice for years. And this is the way it was for me for years. But I can tell you what, I don't know about him. I know one thing. When I heard his voice. I could actually see for the very first time. And that's the difference that Jesus Christ makes in our life. For the very first time, we can see and we can actually do what is right. We're born again. We're given new sight for the very first time. It's an absolutely wonderful history of the, what God is doing. Look at verse 30. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes... Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. I mean, you, you see this. The healed beggar was sarcastic with them. And so he's poking in them. He says, this is a remarkable, astounding, and am amazing thing that you don't know where Jesus came from, even though he's healed me and he's opened my eyes. In other words, you guys do not know everything like you think you do. You think you know everything, but you don't. 
And the beggar proceeded to teach the Pharisees, God does not listen to the prayers of the wicked. He hears the prayers of those who worship him and do his will. Did they know that from Scripture? Well, Proverbs 15, 29, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. Psalm 34, 15, The eyes of the Lord upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Question is, do you worship the Lord and do his will? If not, it will affect your prayer life. The Bible says so. Verse 32 says, Since the world began... Was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Their scriptures recorded no such miracle. Memory, experience, all of history had no such miracle to display that someone was healed of congenital blindness. His was a solitary case. It was a tribute to the nature of the one who had healed him. And he was now quite sure who Jesus was. He didn't know everything, but he knew, hey, this guy is different. As in the case of the woman at the well, we see a man growing in the knowledge of God. All of the might of the Sanhedrin couldn't scare him. They couldn't uh, shake him at all because why? He really is beginning to understand who he is. And he knows, in contrast to what they have offered, he's been given, he's given, been given sight. He's been given freedom for the first time. Without somebody directing him where he goes and leading him where he goes and saying he can and cannot do this. The one who had performed this miracle was a man that is called Jesus. And this man was a prophet, and he was not a sinner. He was a man of God heard, a man who worshipped God. He was a man of God, and the blind man defended him. But thirdly, the former blind man's dismissed from the synagogue. And you're just like, you've got to be kidding me. He's dismissed from the synagogue. You have to understand, and I have to understand in context, this is a big thing in the culture that he lived in. It was a huge thing. You see, verse 34 says, They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. See, their response was abuse, it was insults, and it was literally threats. And they cry, How dare you to tell us what you think? And so they cast him out. They what? They excommunicate him. Like he's some pariah. He's some spiritual leper. To be avoided by one and all who did not want to share his fate. You think about this. What would that mean to him socially? What would it mean to him spiritually to be excommunicated? Well, excommunication meant that no one would employ him. His family would disown him. He could have no part in the religious services of the synagogue, and he couldn't go to the, the, the worship of the temple. Anyone, anyone caught helping him would be exposing himself to a similar fate. You say, really, is this, this true? Yeah, the Christian life is not a bed of roses. And if we're not careful in America, that's the way we like to position it that way. You said Christ, and you'll be fine. You'll be fine in eternity. But you will be persecuted now. All those who live godly shall suffer persecution. You don't have to go looking for it. All you have to do is live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. And you will be different. That's what infuriated the Pharisees. 
this guy is different. And he's not doing the way we think it ought to be done. And if you and I will do it Jesus' way, it is the perfect way. But it comes along with consequences. That's okay. That's okay. You say, you make no sense. What did they do to the one that we're trying to act like? They crucified him. What did he ever do that was wrong? Watch this. That's a big word. Let me take it apart. No thing did he do wrong. Not one. And yet he gave his life. We have to remember, if I'm going to act like him and be like him, are they going to respond in the same way? Yes, because why? Because there's no change in their life. They're the same. And so they rebel and they hate that you are living a righteous life. And when you and I live a righteous life in front of them, you and I are showing them a mirror of who they are and where they're at and what needs to be changed in their life. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. But for some reason, we have this thought that, well, if that happens, then I'm not doing right. That stinking thinking because that's the way they think. They said only good things happen to good people. Heard that lately? No, not, we've not only heard it. Sad part is a lot of times we think it. When it comes to our own life. We say, hey, I've been doing what's right. I've been doing exactly what I think the Lord would have me to do. I don't know of any big sin in my life. I, and why are all these things happening to me? Because you're living right. You're living right. So continue to live right. And don't run from him. There's all types of ways that you can run from him. One of the worst ways that people run from God is they leave church. They leave church out of it. Get me away from that. I want my own thing and I want my own way. And all those people are a bunch of hypocrites. They're all. Tell me where in the world you can go that there's not hypocrites. Zero. Nowhere. Nowhere. So what do you do? You as a hypocrite, you confess your, faith, uh, your sins. God forgives you of your sins and wipes you off and you start walking again with the Lord. Don't run from him. We need one another. We need one another. It wasn't wrong that they needed the synagogue. The wrong part was who was leading the synagogue and the way they were leading it. Church has always been God's idea. His idea to come up with church, his idea to run church, his idea. And if we will strive to do it his way, it's a wonderful thing. Amen? Amen? I love church family. Because why? Because we can go to one another, put our arm around one another, say, hey, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you right where you're at. 
That's what the church needs. They weren't looking at it that way. They were saying, I want it my way, and I want it done this way, and there's no way this. He's got to be a sinner. Because he's not doing it the way we said to do it on the Sabbath. How dare him come in here and heal somebody that's congenitally blind? How dare him come to the pool of Bethesda and do what he's doing? How dare him? It's like, step back. How dare you question what God's doing? And has he went against his holy word? Not one time. Not once. Secondly, quickly, reckoning Jesus and the blind man. Reckoning Jesus and the blind man. So what happens? The Savior says he's coming to the world for two reasons. What are those reasons? And sometimes when you sit there and you look at this, you're like, really? This is the reasons? He gives it to you, first of all, that the blind might see. That the blind might see. Verse 39 says, And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see. Behind those words lay the contrast between the man, born blind now, that could see, but not physically, and the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees as well as the nation of Israel. The Lord's presence in the, the world was a great divide, separating what? Believers from unbelievers, a truth from falsehood. He's separating those that can see from those that are blind. And spiritual sight will be given to all those who what? Who will sincerely ask. He will give you, he will give you sight. First of all, the witness by Jesus. Look at verse 35. He informs the former blind man that he is in need, he's indeed the Messiah. He's the one. He's very clear about this. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. You see, all this time the Lord had remained out of sight. And as you read and you think about it, you think, well, why wasn't he right there all the time? He does this so often to new believers. To say, did you really believe in me? And so what happens? He gets kicked out of the church. Jesus goes looking for him. Did you get that? Jesus looks for him. And he says, do you know, do you believe on the Son of God? That word, Son of God, some of you who may have an ESV or another translation, it says the Son of Man. How many, how many have Son of God in your, book, in your Bible? Son of God? How many have Son of Man? It's okay, really. Okay, There's a, there is a, um, an opinion that differs between whether that was the Son of God or the Son of Man. It makes no difference. Okay, so just cool your, your breezes there. It's okay. Don't get ruffled. It's okay. Really, it is. But is there a difference? It could be the Son of God. It could be the Son of Man. What are we talking about? Well, this is what he's talking about. The Son of God versus the Son of Man. Opinions are divided in any case. The Lord now presented himself before this man in order to give him a further revelation of himself. As the one who is worthy of total allegiance, Jesus found him cast out by a dead religious system. And this is interesting. He presented himself before him as the one in whom now and forever he should believe. As son of man, he was here to link himself with humanity and fulfill God's purposes on earth. As son of man, that's what he was doing. As the son of God... As the Son of God, what's he doing? He was co-eternal. He was co-equal. He was well uh, with the Father. He was worthy to be worshipped as God over all. He was blessed forevermore. So it makes no difference which way. Jesus revealed himself in verse 37, And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. The man's eyes were riveted to the face of Jesus. I think this is a beautiful scene. 
His eyes are riveted to the face of Jesus. He had not seen much yet with the new eyes. And as long as he lived, I don't care if he lived till as old as Methuselah, it didn't make a difference. He would never forget that first sight of Jesus, and he would also never forget his voice. Forever. He would remember that. So what's his reaction? Immediately down. And he worships. He worships. So you have the witness by Jesus, but also the worship of Jesus. Jesus will give the witness. If you receive the witness, you will worship. You will worship. And it's exactly what happens here. Verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. The true worship of God always will involve Jesus. Don't ever forget that. There's some that will tell you Allah is our God. He's not the God of the Bible. He is not. God Jehovah is the God of the Bible, and he will always include Jesus in the worship. The person who thinks he knows it all, but doesn't realize he can't spiritually see is the person who is totally and truly blind. Only the person who realizes his weaknesses and spiritual helplessness can be helped and truly forgiven and can actually gain spiritual insight and understanding. But lastly, notice he came also that those who think they can see might be blinded. You say, what? That's kind of cruel. Overhearing this, the Pharisees rightly concluded that Jesus was referring to them. Verse 39, and Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world. Why? That they which not might see. That's the first one. And then the second one, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now say ye, We see. Therefore your sin remaineth. See, some Pharisees standing by instantly reacted, and Christ then exposed the fact that they were laboring under a greater delusion. If their eyes had been truly open, they would have been prostrate in the dust right before him in the example of the man born blind, and they would be worshiping. And you see this over and over again. We pray for the peace of Israel. Do you recognize the blindness of the nation of Israel toward Christ represented by these Pharisees was real? And it led them to murder their Messiah. It was, it's persisted for 2,000 years. And it led the Apostle Paul, who once had been of their number, to say these words in Romans eleven twenty five: 25, For I would not, brother, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Blindness in part... Will they as a nation receive him? No. But can they as individuals? Amen, says one who knows exactly what he's talking about. And it happens. And that's why we pray for the Israel. We pray for the Jewish people. But watch this. And don't ever forget this. We also pray for the Palestinian people. And there's some people who say, wait, wait, wait a minute. It's, it's, it's either or. Nope. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, that just those that agree with him, nope, that for whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So when we pray for Israel, we are praying for the peace of Jerusalem 
Because why? That's God's holy place. It's been since the get-go that way. We pray because we're commanded to do that. But we're praying also for all of mankind. That all of mankind, whether they're Jew or non-Jew, would bow the knee and receive the greatest gift ever given to mankind. And that's the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's who we are as Christian people. And so it's not like we're either or, you've got to be this way. No. We pray for everyone. Do you agree with what the nation of Israel does? No, I don't agree with everything they do. Do I agree with the United States and what we do? No. But do I pray for her? Yes. Do I pray for them? Yes. How can I do that? Only because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Because I've been born again and changed from the inside. See, I didn't say outside yet. I'm still working on that. That's called sanctification. But I've been born again and changed from the inside. And want to be more like him each and every day. And so we pray in their behalf we worship the Lord and we give thanks to Him for He has given us the sight that we have. In John chapter 9, it's not so much organized religion, excommunicating. That's not so much the man that Jesus touched with His eyes. No, Jesus excommunicated or organized religion out of touch with Him. And we need to be in touch with Him. And what he wants done. Before we leave this chapter, we want to think about, if we could just read it again, we're not doing that, but if we could just read it again, understand the stages that he went through as a new believer. First of all, stage one, he began by calling Jesus a man. A man that is called Jesus, open mine eyes, verse 11. He began by thinking of Jesus as a wonderful man. He had never met anyone who could do the kind of things that Jesus did. And he began by thinking of Jesus as the supreme man. He is the supreme man. We do well sometimes to think of the sheer magnificence of the manhood of Jesus. I'm mean, him taking on flesh and blood and living for us. That's mind boggling. Whatever is in doubt, there is never any doubt that Jesus was a man among men. Stage two, he went on to call Jesus a prophet. When he asked, that's verse 17, he is a prophet. And a prophet is a man who brings God's message to men. Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord does, uh, God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. A prophet is a man who lives close to God and has penetrated into his inner counsels. And when we read the wisdom of the words of Jesus, we are bound to say this is indeed a prophet. If ever any man had the right to be called a prophet, Jesus had that right. But notice stage three, the blind man came to confess that Jesus was the son of God. He wasn't just a man. He wasn't just a prophet. He was the very son of God. He came to see that human categories were not adequate to describe him. Uh, the story is told about Napoleon was once in a company in which a number of clever skeptics were discussing Jesus. And they dismissed Jesus as a very great man and nothing more. <laughs> Napoleon said this, gentlemen, I know men and Jesus Christ was more than a man. He was a lot more than a man. If Jesus Christ is a man and only a man, I say... That of all mankind I cleave to him, and to him will I cleave always. If Jesus Christ is a God and the only God, I swear, I will follow him through heaven and hell, the earth, the sea, and the air. It's a tremendous thing about Jesus that the more we know him, the greater he becomes. It's not so with us, is it? The more we know each other, the more we know all of our weaknesses, all of our failings, and what a mess we are. But you know what? The more you know Jesus, 
the more you're just astounded. He is holy. He's perfect. He's absolutely the best friend we could ever have. So I encourage you, friend. I hope and pray that you walk away having spiritual sight. That you see that Jesus Christ is God. He's exactly who he says he is. And he can be trusted with not only everything, but really specifically with your life. With your life. So I encourage you, if you've never given your life to Christ, you've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior, I beg of you, go to him. Go to him and ask him. And he said, for whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come. And because we know that, those of us who've received him, we ought to be telling others, you can know where you're going to spend eternity, friend. There should be no doubt in your mind where you're going. And I just want to share with you, this is what Jesus has done in my life. He's the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. Amen?